We don't do this very often, but I just want to kind of speak into something that's going on internationally right now, and we haven't addressed it. Last time I preached two weeks ago, uh, we hadn't talked about it, and it was just breaking out the war in Israel, uh, Gaza Strip, and the Hamas attacking and massacring and terrorism going on in Israel. And when I preached last time, it was just kind of fresh, and they were doing some uh, rocket launching uh, at that time, and so I didn't speak into it. Obviously, as a Bible-believing church, as Christians, we support Israel. Israel's God's chosen. We pray for peace for Jerusalem and Israel, but we haven't addressed it. Now, what what is going on now is similar to what went on in 09 and 11 and 2012 or 2014. And so what is dissimilar or not like what was going on? And if you're a prophecy person, you're wondering about Ezekiel 37, 38, Psalm 83, some of that going on. What's fascinating as this drama plays out, it is no game. It is no game. Uh, it could be the unfolding of the very end. It could be. If those armies converge from all different sides of Israel, you need to stay tuned because we could be close. Now, some things have to happen, but they haven't happened yet, but they could in a heartbeat. And so be abreast, pay attention, be alert, don't quit your jobs, don't, uh, Dig into your 401k, Chris is not saying, but just stay on the alert because we are obviously living in the last day since 1948. And so I just want you to know that we're aware. Some of you think, well, we're taking this lightly. You're not paying any attention. No, but we're not overreacting like we have a tendency, you know, uh, a certain percentage of you go crazy with some of the stuff. And, you know, the other thing is that there's rockets launched at Israel all the time. Do you understand that? Uh, Israel and Jews, I, I, I just checked the facts and, uh, you know, there's only like 14.6 million Jews in the world. Now, in a world of 8 billion people, that's 0.2% of the world that's Jews. Okay. Half of them live in the United States. The other half live in Israel. I'm just saying that obviously there are some in the Europe and Russia and all over, right? And what I don't understand is, I mean, Israel is two-thirds the size of Indiana. It, uh, the West Bank is really not the West Bank. The West Bank pervades most of Israel. And so there's a Palestinian presence. There's a mixed group of people in Israel that they get along and they actually love each other. I met Muslims, I met Palestinians, I met Arabs, I met Jews. But these fanatical extremes are what create what is going on in Israel right now. Most people, like us, just want to get along. We may not agree politically, we may not agree religiously, but we just want peace. And that's what the majority of people want. But Understand that God's timeline is marching on, and there will be an end of all things. And in that, within that backdrop, you need to understand the sovereignty of God. Now, there's a level of uncertainty, but God is always sovereign, and God is in control, and nothing surprises God. Okay. So if your anxiety or depression or whatever you're on is going off, Hey, you're not you're not acting in the shalom of God and the peace and the calmness and the tranquility that God provides in levels of uncertainty. And I, I just want to speak into that because, uh, you know, he has it in his hands and he has you in his hands. And so if you're fixated and all you're doing is watching the news and depressed and ang- anxious, you know, quit it. That's my counseling for you. Stop it. Know, know that there's a God. He's in control. He's got all our destinies planned out, and he is able. So if it is, hey, let's go. Amen? Maranatha. If it's not, 
And let's not worry about it because he's in control. He's going to do his perfect work. So so let's just pray together and then I'll get into the sermon. <laughs> this is the pre-sermon to the sermon. Uh, but God's in control. And as I grow older, what God, what people intend for evil, God intends for good. And God is going to do a great work. And we're just going to pray that some people of all religious persuasions will know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior before the end. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just take this moment in time as we always pray for peace for Jerusalem, but also for Israel. And Father, they're your chosen, but we've been grafted in, most of us. And we just need to be reminded of your sovereignty and and that you're in control of international events. And Father, we don't understand what's going on or why people would even care to kill each other over a little piece of ground and a few people in comparison to the world's population. We don't understand, Father, but you do. And that you're present and you're in control and your timeline is marching on. And Father, our job is just to help people be ready and and to be alert. And Father, if we're fixated too much, then we're not going to be doing what you call us to do in the moment where we are, where you have us to do your will. And at the same time, Father, we don't want to be so blind of of what you're doing internationally that we can't share the gospel because people in the world are alerted to this and and are looking for understanding. And we need to share the gospel in this moment that they might know and they might come to a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we put our faith and our trust in you and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we're in this rooted series, and and even this framework of what's going on in Israel kind of goes along with what we preached the last couple weeks. John did a great job last week talking about there's an evil presence and what we see innocent people dying in Israel, evil presence, and justifying it by a religion when it's just massacre. Uh, We see what I talked about in in the idea of suffering and innocent suffering. We see that on the news all the time. God's still in control. He is dealing with a broken, fallen world that he sent himself, Jesus, to save. So the question this morning, when we're getting ready for, we're we're completing week six of our study, and we're going to start day one of week seven tomorrow, and I'll be preaching more about this in supplemental form to what you are reading in in our rooted book. If you haven't got a rooted book and want to join us, we're about seven weeks into it, but this is the rooted book. I haven't picked one up and brought it up here before, but the question today is how do you define greatness? How do you define greatness? Some might define it as the goat. Goat meaning the greatest of all time. Who's the greatest of all time? If you're into soccer, and probably not a lot of you are, but I know some of you are, maybe it's uh, Messi or it's Ronaldo. If you're old like me, you remember this guy named Pele that was like the greatest of all time back in the day. If you're a a football fan, I hate to say that maybe the quarterback, that former quarterback of the New England Patriots, a lot of people think that he's the GOAT. But if Ursay would have bought a quarterback or, I mean, a line for uh, Peyton Manning, I think he could have been the greatest of all time. Could have been. In other sports or events, maybe there's the greatest of all time that you're thinking about. And and a lot of times we look at greatness and we think of it in a worldly way, greatness in the world or in social media. And maybe if you're like me, I I vacation at home and work, but, but you had friends go to Florida and they took pictures of themselves with their legs tanning and a book in their hand like they ever had read a book in their lives. Maybe on and posting it on Facebook like this is the life of the what rich and famous. Oh, I'm glad you're my friend. Sort of. Or on Instagram. 
and we look at that and we look at uh, castles and cathedrals and huge places and and their uh, highlight reel as opposed to our average every day of what we're doing. But in that, a lot of times we get caught up in this whole idea of greatness in the world and in social media. But there's something more, isn't there? And and obviously you're in church today, and 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 we want to look at greatness when it comes to the kingdom of God. What does greatness mean there? Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 10, verses 42. And I think that when we go and ask questions like who's the goat or who's the greatest, I think Jesus is a good source, a reliable uh, advice giver to our lives spiritually. And, and, And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In the kingdom of God, greatness is service and not status. In the kingdom, it's service, not status. And I hope in your mind you're asking the question, why? Why service, not status? And I want you to understand this, that it's impossible to love Jesus without serving people. It's impossible because Jesus was about people. John chapter 13, verse 1. And this is Jesus' final day, next to the last day of his life. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now that term to the end is ace telos in the Greek. It means that he loved them to the end, just like it's translated in ESV. To the end is to the fullest extent, to the uttermost. He loved them to the end. Something I wish I could help you feel and know to the what do I want to say, to the end of yourself is how much God loves you, how much Jesus loves you. He loves you to the end. No matter who you are, where you are, and where you are in your walk with him, and even if you're not walking with him, he loves you like that, with a crazy radical love, unlike anyone else. If you ever wonder if you're loved by God, you are. Scripture says it over and over again. If you understood how much the Father loved you, I wouldn't have to preach anymore because you would radically change and transform the world around you. You see, there's no end to his love. No end. And and, and here's the thing. Jesus just didn't talk about his love. He doesn't state his love. He shows his love. I mean, it's just not words. It's not like somebody romancing you and buttering you up to get something. It's not how Jesus did it. He backed it up with action. You see, Jesus shows it in the most personal and powerful way, and that was by serving. Here's the greatest of all time. Greatest person of all time that ever lived, ever existed. Obviously, he existed from the very beginning. And he served. Notice in verses 4 and 5 of John 13, he says, He rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. 
Now, I want you to look, and this is going to go really quick, So, and this is why you don't have notes here, because I, you, you all complain, oh, I can't fill in the blanks. Here's Jesus. I, I'm a very compassionate, empathetic pastor. Sorry, blank fillers. I, you know, if, it, reason why you take, I, I want to stop here. The reason why you take notes, reason why I, I, we do an outline every week is because in, in less than 48 hours, you'll forget everything I said. If you write it down, there's a lot higher percentage that you might remember and might apply it to your life. So that's why we do that. And so when you write it, it makes a difference. I am a copious note writer. So you guys that are filling in the blanks, I am with you. I want you to, I empathize with you. Even though I make fun of you because you're OCD, I, I love you. Okay? And Jesus loves you. Jesus, seven acts of service. We're going to run through them. You're not going to get them all. Number one, he got up. These are actions. He took off his outer garment. Number three, he wrapped a towel around his waist. Number four, he poured water into a basin. Number five, he knelt down. Number six, he washed the disciples' feet. Number seven, he dried their feet with a towel. Now, I told you you'd never be able to keep up, right? Now, here's the important thing. I want you to get this. Jesus got up. That's it. He did something. I hear people talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about what they're going to do. I'm tired of hearing you talk. Do something. Just do it already. If you're talking about it, you're not doing it. And don't talk about somebody else doing it. You do it. Now, the best moments in my life are when I've done something. Took action. I pursued my wife-to-be when we were dating. I romanced her. It wasn't just talk. It was action. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to get something done, I do it. And it makes a difference. Quit talking. Start doing. If you want to have a life that matters, and got to ask you a question, do you want to have a life that matters? Quit talking. Start doing. Get up. Get up. Want to live a life that makes a difference? I hope you do. You've got to get up. you got to do something. It's not all about information processing and content transformation. Tra- tra- what do I want to say? Uh, content communicating. No. It's actually doing something. Jesus got up. He took off his outer clothing. He placed a servant's towel around his waist. If our Lord and Master did that, so can you. So can I. He removed what was on the outside and it revealed what was on his on the inside. And it was humility. Let me say that again for you note takers. He removed what was on the outside and revealed what was on the inside. Humility. It wasn't about status. It wasn't about what he had. It wasn't about who he was. It was about what was here. And that was humility. If you removed what's on the outside of your life, I wonder what others would see on the inside, on your inside. What would it be? Would it be humility? See, God doesn't just care about what you do. He cares about the way you do it. Now, I have this problem in my life. I don't know about you, but I have that problem in my life. You can do the right thing the wrong way with the wrong motives and still be wrong. And I do things like that. And I have discussions in my head with God. And I don't know if you do this or not. God, I don't want to get out, get up today. I don't want to go do that. I don't want to go do this. I know I should. And then I have to check my attitude because I don't feel like doing it. I don't want to do it. You ever have those conversations with yourself? And, 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 and what you have to do is you just got to go and do it. Got to get that. Get out of bed. You got to put your clothes on. You got to go do it. Now, I want you to get the context of John chapter 13. This was a formal Passover meal. It was a celebratory meal that Jesus and his disciples were going to experience that last night of his life. 
And in this moment, we remember Jesus' one act of service. Not the only act of service, but this is the big one. And we've got to remember the backdrop of the Passover is this. It reminds the Israelites, the Jews, of God's faithfulness, of his forgiveness, and of his goodness. Faithfulness, forgiveness, and goodness. You preach a sermon on that. Of God's faithfulness is how he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. His his forgiveness, because you remember the Lamb of God that, that also did not have a bone broken. It was supposed to be a perfect lamb, a firstborn lamb that was sacrificed for the Passover in the sense of that they ate that with bitter herbs and spices before on that before they left uh, Egypt. That was a foreshadow of God's forgiveness that Jesus would come and die on a cross for and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sin. And a reminder of God's goodness that we who are chosen of God, loved by God, uh, he is good toward and wants the best for us. That's what the Passover is a reminder and a celebration of. Now, at that moment, In this celebratory moment, an argument breaks out. And what was the argument all about? Again, it's about who is the greatest of all time. Who's the greatest apostle? Who's the best? Who's the one that's going to do and succeed and be the CEO of this new new followership of Jesus? Who's, who's going to be the one that's going to represent on social media, on Facebook and Instagram and all those others? Who's going to be the influencer? That's what they were fighting about. Isn't that ridiculous? They were totally missing the moment. And Jesus looked across that room, and you got to remember that they were laying beside each other. I don't know how you would eat on your side, and you know, no fork in, in with your hands. I think that would be a total mess. And then you'd have you know guys laying around, and and feet would be in front of somebody else's face. It'd be I just don't know how they did it. But when Jesus looked around that room that night, what did he see? He saw. Proud hearts and dirty feet. Proud hearts and dirty feet. That's what he saw. He didn't see greatness. He saw proud hearts and dirty feet. And what did Jesus really see? He saw a need. And he got up and he knelt down and he washed dirty feet. Not because, not because here was the most important person in the universe and he knelt down and washed dirty feet. And this is how Jesus showed his love to the very end because there is no very end to his love. He saw proud hearts, but, but he knew that he could t- take care of of dirty feet in that room. Now, you got to ask the question, I, I, this is what I wonder, is why didn't any of the other disciples take the job? And I would say because they were too proud. They were too concerned about who was the greatest in the room to serve one another. They were too proud. And, and, and the question is, in our pride, do we often criticize those with dirty feet instead of washing them? I'm not going to do that. They didn't do this. They could do this. They could do this. Why don't they do this? Why don't we just wash their feet? Why don't we just serve them? Who's the greatest? Who is the greatest? See, greatest isn't about status. It's about service. It's about service. Because we can't love Jesus without serving people. If we say we love Jesus and we don't serve people, there's not a lot of credibility in your statement. There's not a lot of integrity in your, in your life if you're not serving people. 
The question then becomes, do you want to be great in the kingdom of God? Do you want to be great? Three things we got to do is first watch for a need. Watch for a need. See the need and meet it. Watch for it. See it and meet it. We were at Cover Bridge yesterday. I uh, I was on vacation, and we went with the I went with the grandkids on Wednesday, but we hadn't been to Mansfield yet. So, we, you know, I called our daughter and said, "Hey, you want to go? Can the kids go with me to Mansfield?" And so we were walking around Mansfield, and I was hungry, hadn't eaten, and had worked yesterday morning, and had something to eat. And we were walking around, and both uh, we have I. Two granddaughters, one's eight and one's 11, and, and the little redhead who's eight was carrying this huge jug of water around with her. And her mom had said, you know, if you take that with you, you probably won't bring it home. And I got to talking to this lady. She had this Yellowstone T-shirt I thought was pretty cool. It had a, a rip on it that said, it said, uh, I will take you to this train station. Now, if you're a Yellowstone fan, you know what that means. If you don't, don't bother. Don't don't watch it. But I said, hey, I like your T-shirt. And we struck up this conversation. And all the while, my little redhead got involved in the conversation and left her water bottle behind. And we walked off. And lo and behold, the lady that was running that booth, we were probably, I don't know, um, a few hundred feet beyond the booth on onto the next thing. And she ran out and brought us that water jug back. And uh, we said, thank you. But that was an act of service that she wouldn't have had to done, but she did. You know, she saw a need and she met it. It was simple. It was simple. Folks, God does, isn't asking you to move heaven and earth. They're, he's just saying, see a need, be kind, do something. Get up. And when you see that need, you maybe need to think, I can do that. I can help in this little way. It doesn't take a humongous act of service. No, it's just one little thing. To say to yourself, this is mine. I can do that. I can help. And, and, the, and when we do this and, 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 and not make it a spectacle of, see how good I am, uh, and post it on Facebook. You know, folks. I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on this uh, social media thing right now, and, and if you're watching online, I'm glad you're here and you're with us and keep watching, but, but we'd love to have you in if you, if you can be here. But if you're in Canada or if you're my parents in Florida, we get it. We know you can't be here, and, and we're glad you're joining us. But otherwise, you can't have community without being present with one another, and you, and you need a community. Uh, where was I? I just... I just drove you off the edge. <clears throat> online, uh, yeah. You know, if you're posting online all the time, I'm not buying it. And I don't know everybody else. All you're doing, all you're doing, and, 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 and you're, you're showing a life that doesn't exist to impress people that don't care. And, and you, you need to realize that what you're doing, God knows who you are. And I'm not trying to place guilt on you, but he knows the real you. He knows who you are. And you're not fooling anybody except yourself. And I think that's a lot of what's going on. It's a lot of self-deception, a lot of uh, illusion and filters that are being created. And, and, and gosh, wouldn't it be nice to just meet people that had integrity and were genuine and vulnerable and who they really were instead of what they posted online? I, mean, I don't know that person. If you're not serving, there is a need God wants you to meet, and it's not being met because only you can meet it. Only you are in this sphere of influence in, in relationships with people that you will only touch for the kingdom of God, by the grace of God. And there's something that God wants to be done that isn't being done that only you can do. And you've got to choose to get up and do it. Now, I want you to understand, when you do this, 
I want you to understand, because his love had no end, Jesus served anyway. You're going to serve some people that you don't really like and, and you don't really want to, but you know that you're called to do that. Now, I want you to know that some people are going to take you for granted. That's just part of it. That's okay. Serve anyway. Because you're not serving them, you're serving God in his name. And now, some people that you serve aren't going to appreciate it, they're going to take it for granted, and they're going to expect it. And they're going to call you at inconvenient times, and they're going to interrupt your life, and they're just going to expect it. Guess what? Serve anyway, because you're serving God. And guess what? Even though it's Pastor Appreciation Month, even though, and I, I, and I feel very appreciated, so this is, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to go there. Some people will never fully appreciate it. Who cares? Serve anyway. Your focus should be on your relationship with God and what God calls you to do because he called you to do it. You're serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the master of the universe. And in that, we should take satisfaction, fulfillment, and know that we are doing his will for his glory, not for ourselves. So don't post that on Facebook. Just do it because you want to serve God. Amen? Will you please stand and pray with me? Eternal God and Father, we are grateful that you call us to serve, that in, in those moments that we can be called and used by the, your Spirit for your glory, by your grace, that that feeling and indwelling of knowing that we are doing your will would be enough for us. That, Father, the pride that goes against anything that has to do with serving others, that you take that away from our lives, that your humility and your grace would be a part of our life as we serve you and you alone. And Father, may we hear your Spirit's voice and, and move with your Spirit that we might meet needs and help others. And, and Father, that we might feel that satisfaction that only can come from you in doing your will. Because Father, you created us as your workmanship to do good to serve others that you might be glorified. May your light shine and reflect from us to others that they might be drawn to that light to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may the kindness that you give and the mercy that you give be evident in our lives together. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.